welcome everybody uh, to the uh, Language Technology and Data Analysis Laboratory Webinar Series 2021. Um, before we start, I'd like to uh, read out an acknowledgement of country. The University of Queensland uh, acknowledges the traditional owners of their custodianship of the lands on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. I'm reading this out because um, the LADAL, which is organizing uh, this webinar series, um, has been established and is supported by the School of Languages and Cultures at the University of Queensland. If you would like to know more about uh, the Language Technology and Data Analysis Lab, uh, you can go to our homepage. Um, you'll also find more information about the uh, webinar series and upcoming as well as past talks and more information on the um, webpage for the webinar series. You can follow us on Twitter. You'll be alerted to all uh, upcoming talks. And you can also contact us via email using our um, slcladal at uq at edu dot uh, au um, address. Today's presentation is by Monica Battenreck and the talk's entitled Corpus-Based Media Linguistics, a case study of linguistic diversity in Australian television. And I'm very, very fond of um, Monica's work. Uh, it's uh, Corpus-Based is really interesting. And to familiarize you with Monica, I'll just present her and introduce her real briefly. Oh, that's actually horrible. Why do I have? <laughs> that was copy and paste. I, I don't, I'm so sorry. Okay. Monica Battner, right. not Gerold right. Schneider. <laughs> this, oh, that's horrible. Is Professor of Linguistics at the University of Sydney and Director of the Sydney Corpus Lab, which is collaborating with Ladal. Her research uses corpus linguistic methodologies across um, a variety of fields, including media linguistics, discourse analysis, and social linguistics. So she's a trained and very prominent corpus linguist. Um, she has a particular interest in the linguistic expression of emotion and opinion with a focus on English. Monica is an author and co-author of six books and two short volumes, as well as numerous journal articles and book chapters. She has co-edited several added volumes and special uh, issues of journals, most recently Corpse Approaches to Telecinematic Language, which appeared in, uh, international, in the International Journal of Corpus Linguistics. And Another special issue, Corpus Linguistics and Education in Australia, which appeared in the Australian Review of Applied Linguistics. She's also on the steering committee of the uh, Asia Pacific Corpus Linguistics Association, and she tweets with at CorpusLing. So again, I'm very, very happy that Monica um, agreed to present in the Ladal webinar series. And this is, of course, not Gerald Schneider. I apologize for, for this huge lap <laughs> lapse. That's okay, Martin. <laughs> so, I think people can tell. <laughs> yes. So uh, here we got the correct name again. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, very happy to stop sharing and for you to take over and continue with your presentation. Okay, thank you. And thanks, uh, thanks everyone for um, being here today. So let me just um, share my screen. So hopefully you can see that. Let me just um, okay, so um I also so I want to say thank you to um, Martin for inviting me um, to speak today, and I also do want to start with an acknowledgement because I'm also based on Aboriginal land, and so I'd, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I live and work. And I want to pay my respects to uh, elders past, present and emerging. Um, as, as Martin uh, mentioned, um, I'm director of the Sydney Corpus Lab. And if you want to know more about the lab, um, I've put the link there on the slide and uh, feel free to check it out. Um, we have a number of blog posts, for example, which you can use in your um, teaching or just read if you're interested in it. So um, what my talk is about is about corpus-based media linguistics, but it's a, bit, a little bit more specific than that, um, in that I'm going to talk about um, a very uh, specific case study that I undertook on three Australian television series, and they're called uh, Redfern Now, Mystery Road, and Clever Man. 
and I'm going to talk more about these series um, in a second and introduce them a, a little bit if you if you don't know them already. So I, I want to just start um, with defining some terms from the title of my talk here today. Um, and I'm going to start by uh, talking a little bit about media linguistics. Okay, so um, what is media linguistics? Um, very in a very simplified um, way, it's the linguistic study of language in traditional and new media. Um, it is interdisciplinary and informed by media theory. And it's very much interested in looking at um, media language in its own right. So con it, it does consider medium specific aspects of language use. And it may include the study of production and reception as well. So how is media language produced? Um, how is it received or consumed? There are alternative and overlapping terms uh, used instead of media linguistics. So sometimes people talk about media discourse analysis. Sometimes they talk about media stylistics. They're not exactly um, identical, I, I would say, but uh, it, it depends to some extent on um, the country of um, origin. So the term media linguistics is really quite a European term. Um, and I think it, it, it is used in, in Russia as well, but it's more and more used in English too um, as a cover term. So, so that's what I'm basically mean by media linguistics. And when I talk about uh, corpus-based media linguistics, as I did in the title, I actually just mean using corpus linguistics in this endeavor uh, to analyze media language. So I don't specifically mean corpus-based in opposition to corpus-driven. Um, I'm just talking about corpus linguistic uh, approaches to um, media linguistics. Um, the second um, part of the title of my talk uh, mentions linguistic diversity. So again, what do I mean uh, by diversity? Um, I'm just using it here as a, as a cover term. So on the one hand, I would say when I, when I, when I use the term diversity, um, I would include um, person attributes such as age, culture, ethnicity, nationality, gender, religion, sexuality, um, disability, and so on. Uh, but I would also use it to refer to diversity with respect to language use, um, looking at languages and language varieties. So, um, by linguistic diversity in particular, I mean diversity with respect to language use, but in general diversity covers that as well as a, as a broader cover term, if you will. So um, in relation to the media, um, just to briefly consider um, a proposal that was made by Napoli, he uh, made some distinctions between different types of diversity in the media more generally. So for example, he talks about source diversity which is basically looking at the diversity of media ownership and of the workforce. So in the Australian context, um, we might be looking at who owns the newspapers, who owns television stations, et cetera, how much diversity is there. And in terms of the workforce, we might be looking at who are the people who work in the media. Is it mostly, uh, say, uh, white Anglo-Australians or is it more diverse? Then he uh, talks about content diversity. So then we're looking at the content, obviously. And uh, here he distinguishes um, different types within this category. Um, so he talks about format or program type diversity. So looking at the types of programs that there are. So think about genres. So whether there's um, just um, sitcoms or drama or what type of drama is there, um, what kind of diversity of different um, programs can we find? Then uh, he also includes here what he calls demographic diversity, and that here in this case it relates to the people featured in the media. So, for example, um, who do we feature? Who do we see featured in, um, say, television drama? Who do we see featured in reality television? Uh, what kind of diversity is there in relation to person attributes? And the final um, category under this um, content diversity is what uh, is called idea or viewpoint diversity, and this is about um, looking at the diversity in social, political, or cultural perspectives that are um, encoded in the content, in the media content. So for example, when we watch the news in Australia, do we just get a particular perspective or do we get a diversity of perspectives on the same issue? And then the third category is exposure diversity. And so that is about the audience, but it's um, looking at this from the perspective of what you as the viewer or consumer expose yourself to. So just because say, for example, let's say there is content diversity, do you as a viewer actually engage with that content diversity? So for example, do you read a range of different newspapers or do you just read one newspaper? 
Uh, do you watch uh, a diversity of different channels or just one? Um, do you just um, watch sitcoms or do you also watch um, uh, drama? And do you engage with different uh, political views, for example, or is it just that you're consuming what aligns with your own, uh, own, own view? Um, so what you can see here is that Napoli um, really covers the media more generally, uh, not just television series, which is what I'm interested in. And you can also see that diversity, for example, includes uh, types of programs, so uh, genre diversity. And that's something that not, I'm not including um, in my own use of, of diversity in this talk um, today. So instead of using Napoli's conceptualization per se, I want to make a, a similar but slightly different um, distinction. And that's one where I draw on sort of the three perspectives or um, objects of study in relation to television series. Um, so we could look at production in terms of, uh, we could look at diversity from the point of view of production, looking at diversity in the collaborative creation of television series and television dialogue. Um, so maybe we can go into say the writer's room and look at how diversity is created. Um, we can look at the product itself. So the completed television series, the dialogue that we um, encounter when the program is broadcast or um, whether that's live or Netflix or other streaming, dev streaming devices, platforms. And we can look at the reception. So we can look, for example, at the audience and how they might react to different types of linguistic diversity that they consume. So do they, for example, consider the diversity as, um, as being stereotyping them or do they think um, this is appropriate or adequate? So uh, we can look at diversity from different kind of, kinds of perspectives. Now, um, in my talk today, I really only focus on the product perspective. So I look at language use in completed television series. And in, in particular, I'm looking at television dialogue as uttered by actors as they are performing fictional characters. And specifically in the case study, I examine language use in indigenous authored Australian drama. So um, why am I interested in indigenous authored television drama? Um, well, I think it's incredibly important from a cultural point of view. Um, so as, as actor uh, Shari Sevens argues, we live in an, a golden age of indigenous TV. And she says, um, the golden age is upon us. And why? Because we First Nations people have gained control of our narrative. We are exploring storytelling through television in every way we can. We will make mistakes. We will make history. We will spark dialogue and incite empathy. We will no longer accept a non-Indigenous lens fogging over our history and our lived experience. So um, what she refers to as well here is that in the last decade or so in Australia, there ha really has been a, a dramatic turnaround in the amount of Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander characters um, in Australia. So there was a basically has been a, ray, a rise in mainstream television drama with Indigenous creative control. So as a, as, as a, as a viewer in Australia, you encounter a range of uh, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander characters who then um, vary, for example, in their use of standard Australian English, varieties of Australian Aboriginal English, and traditional and new Indigenous uh, languages. But from a linguistic point of view, uh, there's really like a lack of linguistic knowledge of the language varieties that are transmitted to mainstream audiences in this way. And that's uh, why I'm interested in studying this. So just to clarify, um, since this is a media linguistic study, TV dialogue is not treated as a surrogate for naturally occurring conversation. So instead, I'm really interested in creative and self-conscious mediated language use in society. So looking at media language um, as a type of language um, beyond canonical spoken and written domains, and that aligns me with a number of other scholars. And there's just a few um, on the slide, but there are many more. Um, it's also important to look at that in its own right because the narrative mass media as, as uh, social linguistic research has shown uh, really do play a significant role in establishing, reflecting, recycling and changing language ideologies, language attitudes and sociocultural values. And this type of um, uh, ideology that is sort of drawn on and circulated in, uh, in these mediated representation in turn has important social consequences um, and it also may impact on uh, our decision-making and, and behavior. 
So if we look at the uh, social linguistic research, much of the existing research has been undertaken on uh, Hollywood, um, classic Hollywood films. Um, and in these studies, uh, social linguists have found evidence of what's been called uh, so-called standard language ideology. Um, and uh, they've also found evidence for linguistic discrimination or linguistic racism, uh, the construction and use of linguistic and cultural stereotypes. Um, for example, the use of um, limited, iconic and recognizable cues. They have found, um, is it, they have found mock varieties, so varieties that don't exist really. Um, they have found that non-standard language use was used for othering particular characters and also that non-standard language use was associated only with negative uh, or minor characters or humorous characters or so-called weak characters. And, and these tendencies actually have, have been found in relation to many different groups. Um, and so if you want an overview of, of that body of research, I, I have summarized that briefly in, in my 2018 book. I'm just going to give one example here from the US uh, in relation to indigenous characters in US media. So Meek, uh, Barbara Meek, um, in her analysis, identified a, a racialized and racist style of speech that she called um, Hollywood Indian English, which is um, an inauthentic variety made up of a limited set of tokens to serve as indices of Indianness. And in an, another study, she also pointed out that this fluency and linguistic incompetence were normalized as dimensions of Indianness in Westerns. Um, so this body of research uh, mix, but also the, the other research that I mentioned earlier is um, tends to focus on older films uh, rather than contemporary television. And none of it really is on Australian data or on indigenous authored um, television drama. And that's another motivation for, for this case study here. So um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the three programs that I chose. Um, these programs are Red Fern Now, Clever Man and Mystery Road. Um, as you can see, they differ from each other in terms of when they were produced and broadcast. Um, but they're all a few, only a few years apart from each other. Um, they also differ in terms of their genre. So Red Fern Now is a drama anthology. Clever Man is a sci-fi slash supernatural drama. And Mystery Road is a crime drama. Uh, Red Fern Now has a clearly specified urban setting. It's set in Sydney, in the suburb of Sydney. Um, Clever Man also has an urban setting. It was actually filmed in Sydney and other locations, but I think the setting is supposed to be an unspecified city. And then Mystery Road has an outback setting in WA. So um, each of the programs um, is culturally significant in terms of its engagement with um, Australian history, society and identity. Um, so just to give one example, Red for Now was Australia's first major television series commissioned, written, acted, directed and produced by Indigenous Australians. All three programs were broadcast in Australia on the public broadcaster, the ABC. And also important is that all three are mainstream um, programs with a mixed target audience. Um, and that mixed target audience would include um, Indigenous, settler and migrant people um, in Australia. They have also been exported internationally, but um, uh, I think the primary target audience is Australia. And so I just want to point out that as a migrant um, Australian myself, I am a member of this mainstream target audience, and it really is from this non-Indigenous perspective um, that I have approached um, this study. So um, even though I do focus on English um, in this talk, I just want to make a brief note on the use of traditional Australian Aboriginal languages in these dramas. Um, so Red for Now has, has no use, no dialogue in such languages. Clever Man has actually uh, a significant amount of dialogue in, in two languages. And Mystery Road has very minimal dialogue, um, but also at least in two different languages. Um, now, when you look at uh, the closed captioning or the subtitles, these languages are actually not specified. So what you get in the subtitles um, you get really vague generic reference to speaking in indigenous language or uh, speaks indigenous language, um, this sort of thing. And obviously this is highly, highly problematic and it really is also hiding uh, linguistic diversity. Um, so for the reminder of this talk, I will focus on, on English, um, but I thought it was important to point this out here as well. Um, and so more specifically, I'm going to focus on um, Australian Aboriginal English or um, AAE, as I will, I will also use 
as an as a shorthand, I will use AAE. So um, just again, very briefly, what is AAE? It's, it's really a cover term uh, for related varieties that have been associated in linguistics with Aboriginal speakers and um, have specific features of sound, vocabulary, grammar, and cultural norms. But it really is um, a, a broad term for overlapping varieties of the English dialect. And, and it's also important to point out that there's a lot of variation. Um, there's a continuum between um, basilectal and acrolectal varieties. And there's regional variation within Australia. Um, there is also intra-speaker variation and inter-speaker variation. And this is why some people prefer to use the, the plural, so Australian Aboriginal Englishes, or use specific terms for local varieties. Um, so I'm, I'm going to use the term AAE to, as a very broad cover term, and, and I'm focusing specifically on lexis. And so the type of lexis that I'm interested in could, could occur in different varieties of AAE. The corpora, corpora that I'm using in my case study um, consists of transcripts of dialogue from all episodes for each program. So it's uh, 36 episodes in total. Um, uh, so uh, each of the three series has 12 episodes, which is two seasons um, consisting of six episodes each. It's a small corpus, um, just about 130,000 tokens. How was it created? Um, uh, it was created by correcting available online material or it was also transcribed from scratch because it wasn't online material wasn't available for all um, episodes. And I, I got help um, by research assistants um, to do that. So I'm very grateful for that. So um, the, this uh, transcription was mainly orthographic. Um, so the corpus, you can use it for the study of lexical semantic or morphosyntactic features, but um, you can't really use it for the study of pronunciation variants. And um, as I mentioned in this case study, my focus is, is primarily on, on lexis, and that's an appropriate um, focus given the, the transcription. So the method that I used um, that I wanted to try out really is um, lexical profiling. Um, so what is lexical profiling? Um, what you do is you profile the lexical coverage of a text or corpus against um, selected word lists that are pre-chosen. And this is usually done to measure the complexity of texts, um, so associated with, with learner um, language as well or teaching. But what I um, used it for is quite different. I'm not interested in complexity of text, but rather just to identify any potential AAE lexis in the three programs. And once um, this lexis was identified, I was then able to do a more qualitative analysis of these identified words. So um, I, I did it through using AntWord Profiler, but obviously you could also do that differently. Um, so AntWord Profiler is a program compiled, developed by uh, Lawrence Anthony. It measures uh, the vocab level and complexity of text by comparing your study corpus, the corpus of interest, with reference word lists. So in essence, what you do is you compare the words that occur in one text, or in my case, in, in, in one corpus, against a selected list of words. And then that allows you to automatically identify which words occur or don't occur in your corpus and also their frequency and distribution. And on the right, you sort of see the, the structure of, um, of these word lists. So they are structured into uh, head words and sub entries. In the example on the slide here, you can see that the head word, for example, here under accept is actually a word family, not a lemma, but it doesn't have to be like that. And I'm, I'll talk more about the structure of my own word lists in, in a second. And so obviously uh, what I wanted to do is was compare uh, the series with word lists of um, AAE Lexis, but I couldn't find any um, publicly available word lists um, at all really. Um, and I certainly couldn't find any that were available in the format that I wanted, which is basically single word entries, um, a structure of head words and sub entries and uh, just the words, not any meanings or definitions. So I uh, custom created word lists of AAE based on existing linguistic descriptions. And I am uh, by no means suggesting that these are perfect or final word lists. Um, and in fact, I have made them available online so people can see them. 
So um, the starting point for my creation of these word lists were basically existing descriptions of AAE Lexis in linguistics. Um, you can see uh, some references on the slide here. I'm not going to read them out. I also looked at online uh, official public resources, um, including resources, for example, that were published by the Victorian um, Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organization and others. And I used these descriptions and resources, um, first of all, to identify the word list entries, but also to identify spelling variants. Um, some of the words that are um, included in these descriptions of AE Lexis are actually um, uh, words that are used with specific meanings in AAE, but they also occur in mainstream Australian English. And some of these very common words uh, were not included in the list. Um, you can see them examples um, on the slide. And, and that was because I, I wanted to strike a balance between not including or excluding too many such words overall. I mean, it is important to capture them, but it's also important for the form based and uh, end word profiler results to be potentially meaningful at least. But I'll, I'll get back to that question um, later as well. So the, the structure is, um, uh, as I mentioned, headwords and sub entries. In my case, the headwords were largely determined following Arthur's um, uh, dictionary uh, of uh, Aboriginal English, or I don't know if you'd call it a dictionary, but it's a resource. And in terms of the sub entries, uh, they are either relevant word forms of a lemma or spelling variations or alternatives. And you can see examples here um, on the slide. So in the in the example on the on the left, uh, the head word is stream, and then the sub entries are word forms. And then in the example in the middle, the um, uh, sub entries are basically spelling variants of the head word. And in the example of the on the right, the uh, sub entries are alternatives of the of the head word. So the head word can be different things, but it is often um, a lemma. So then I um, I ended up uh, creating two different lists. Um, so list number one basically includes um, all entries where the head word was not um, identified by the word spell checker for Australian English. So I think what that means is that these are words that are also in use in mainstream Australian English, but they are used in specific ways in AAE, for example, with specific meanings. Um, this list may also include uh, AAE words or words from traditional indigenous languages that are codified in the dictionary and are thus relatively familiar in mainstream Australia. List number two, in contrast, um, consists of all of the entries where the head word uh, was basically underlined or identified by the word spell checker for Australian English as I don't know this word. And so that is basically mostly words that are not codified in mainstream Australian English. And it may include some words from a specific traditional indigenous language. So um, you can see that um, uh, list number one uh, consisting of 842 uh, word forms, uh, 300 headwords, basically contains words that are less unique to AAE and perhaps more familiar in mainstream Australia. And then list number two, um, about 612 word forms, basically includes uh, words that are more unique to AAE and perhaps less familiar in mainstream Australia. So by doing then a lexical profile of the three series against these two word lists, we can identify which AAE Lexis is used in the three programs and also whether they use more of the familiar words from list number one or the less familiar lists um, from the less familiar words from list two. And we can also see how they compare um, against each other. So um, Without going into the details, I just want to uh, show you the quantitative results only. So uh, these are the results just based on the AND word profiler output. Um, and as you can see here, the, the head words are called uh, groups and the sub entries uh, are, or the word forms are called types. So um, just again, uh, what is suggested here, um, if we uh, look at list number one uh, percentage coverage, uh, we can see that all three programs use words from list number one much more than words from list number two. And that is the same whether we look at tokens, types or groups, headwords. So I think what that suggests is that there is a tendency 
to use familiar words rather than less familiar words. Uh, clever man, um, sorry, clever man, in fact, uh, uses the most uh, words from list number two compared to the others. Now, if we add up the results um, from list number one and two and compare the programs against each other, we can see that uh, Red for Now has the most uh, token coverage. And then uh, Mystery Road, um, on the other hand, actually has the most type and headword uh, coverage. But in general, also what you can see clearly here is that the three shows are quite similar to each other um, as the differences aren't very large at all. If we briefly look at some of the uh, most frequent and most distributed words here um, on, on the slide, the uh, R stands for the range or the distribution. So if you have here um, R um, more than 31 episodes, it means it occurs then in at least 31 episodes or, uh, in the corpus. And F is the, the raw frequency in this case. So um, I've given you here on the slide all the information, both I've listed both the most distributed headwords or groups and the most distributed word forms or types, and also the most frequent headwords and the most frequent word forms just for, for completeness, but obviously there's actually a lot of overlap here. Um, so um, if we just briefly look at these results here, we, we can see that um, Kinship terms seem to be important, um, as well as also uh, the tag um, A. Um, and that actually confirms a previous study that I undertook where I used a very different corpus linguistic techniques, namely keywords analysis, um, but also actually found that. So that's, um, that's interesting in terms of a triangulation of methods. But we can also see um, other words. So words like right or sorry or long or big and it's really important to point out that these results in the quantitative table and also the results on this slide here, they are purely form based. Um, so what that means is that these words <clears throat> could be used with AAE specific meanings or not. They could also be used with mainstream meanings. Um, we don't know this. Um, we don't know how the word sorry is used. So. Uh, Giving that, using that example again, just to illustrate what I mean, sorry occurs uh, 232 times. If we look at um, each of these um, tokens, we can see that really only three instances of sorry are um, used in AAE specific ways. So uh, we have two uh, references to a sorry place and one to sorry business. And the rest are very mainstream uses of sorry, I'm sorry, you know. And that's obviously a general problem with the form based results. Um, we really need to undertake qualitative analysis of each of the word forms to study how they are used in their co-text. Uh, once we've analyzed them qualitatively, we can then get more accurate results and recalculate some of the numbers. But as you might have noticed, there are almost 6,000 tokens on list number one. And um, only 242 tokens on list number two. Um, and that's so that's again the unword profiler output. So to make it a little bit more manageable, I analyzed all tokens except for kinship terms. So the number of tokens that I analyzed was about 4,500. So uh, I looked at both lists, but I didn't include kinship terms. Um, another reason for not including kinship terms is that in order to really analyze whether the use of these kinship terms is AAE specific, you would need to know the actual relationships between all of the characters who use these kinship terms. Um, and that's really um, uh, it, it pretty much impossible to do. So um, what I did is I classified each token basically as whether it was um, uh, used with AAE specific usage or not. And I did that um, by looking at concordances and sometimes also looking at scenes. And so just in case <clears throat> you don't know what it looks like, but basically um, you that's how I worked. I, I worked with Wordsmith, I worked with a concordance and I annotated each line, concordance line as yes or no in terms of AE specific um, use. And if I couldn't see it from the concordance line, um, I, I went to the actual scene and I looked at that in the wider context. And then finally, if I still couldn't um, get uh, get at it, I actually um, retrieved the video and I, I, I watched the respective scene on the video, but that was 
um, only necessary at sometimes, not, not, not a lot. Mostly you could get it from the, from the extended dialogue. So uh, here's the results from the qualitative analysis of list number one. And one thing that is immediately apparent is that numbers here are much smaller than in the previous table. Okay, so instead of having 257 types, Redfern now only has 41 types. Instead of having 2,639 tokens, it now only has 289 tokens. So what that means is that the quantitative uh, form-based analysis produced many false positives. So many of the words on the list are actually not used in AAE specific uh, ways, but with mainstream meanings. Um, so the usage of AAE Lexis in these three programs is actually even lower than suggested by the, uh, the quantitative form-based results. If we compare the three programs, we can see that uh, Mystery Road has the highest variety in types followed by Redfern Now and Clever Man. And uh, Mystery Road also has the highest proportional usage of tokens. And you can see that if you compare the normalized frequencies. Again, this is followed by Redfern Now and Clever Man. Um, so I did do uh, pairwise comparisons um, to look at statistical significance and the difference in token frequency between uh, Redfern Now and Mystery Road is uh, not statistically significant, but the difference between Red for Now and Clever Man and the difference between Mystery Road and Clever Man um, are statistically significant. So uh, what, what are these uh, words? Um, I wanted to know which, which words might be the most frequent or the most distributed as well. So um, on, on the slide, you can see the words that are in, in the top 10 most frequent in each series. So this is based on the qualitative analysis. Um, and you can also see uh, which words occur in either all three series or at least in two series respectively. And that's the R, R is three means it occurs in all three. So I'm just gonna give you um, a little bit of time to just to look at the words here on the slide. So um, what I take from this slide is that if we if we consider both frequency and range or distribution across series, it, it does seem that um, alongside the, the tag A, which, which turns up here again, it, it does appear that words relating to identity, uh, community, and culture are, are particularly important across uh, series. Um, other important words include uh, flog, um, deadly, and gammon which also likely work um, to index the um, Aboriginal identity of speakers. Or if you, if you wanna talk about it from a stylistic, media stylistic point of view, you could say that the, their function is most likely um, characterization. But that is not to say they don't have other narrative functions. Uh, one would really need to look at this in more detail. I mean, in the qualitative analysis, I basically looked at the token to see whether it was used with AAE specific meaning or not. I didn't look at the token in terms of its narrative function. So that's um, another step. Uh, a step further that you could take here. So um, moving on to the uh, list number two, which is the, the list with the, the less familiar words. Um, please note the low number of tokens in Redfern Now and Mystery Road. There's also a comparatively higher number of tokens in Clever Man. And in this case, the qualitative analysis actually um, does confirm the trends from the purely form-based quantitative analysis. And in this trend, um, which I mentioned earlier, was that Clever Man uses more words from this list number two than the other two programs. Um, how are these words used in the three programs? Uh, now in, in Redfern Now on the left, um, the six relevant instances, they are all uttered by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander characters, both by my main characters and also minor characters. And three, um, three instances refer to the police um, so things like uh, bully man, ganji, uh, ganja bulls, and two instances refer to Aboriginal um, uh, groups, nations, uh, peoples, so Gadigal and Wanarua. Um, in uh, Clever Man, all occurrences except uh, for budo, which is used as a term of address, 
relate to the stories and characters from the dreaming, which is basically central to the plot of Clever Man. Um, and this, I think this storyline, this plot explains why Clever Man uses the most tokens and types from list number two when compared to the other two series. So, you know, the hairy people are important for the, for the plot of Clever Man. If we briefly consider Mystery Road, um, you can see here that the majority um, are instances of Mook, but um, which looks like it occurs 16 times here, but um, across four episodes. But if we if we look at Mook in detail, we can see it is always used as, as Mook Mook. Uh, so Mook Mook um, occurs eight times to address a specific character um, called Fran. And so this is most likely a nickname um, because of her striking eyes, um, so related to appearance. Um, Muki is used as a variant for this nickname just once. If you look at the concordance, you can see that uh, Muk Muk is not idiolectal in, in, this, in the sense um, of just being used by one particular character to address this other character, Fran. Instead, it is actually used by five different characters. Um, so not, not idiosyncratic um, or idiolectal. So that, that seems to be um, uh, quite a... Uh, conscious decision maybe. So just sum up um, to here, um, in general, what, what have I found is, is that it seems to be that there's a relatively low usage of AE words uh, across all three series. And this is perhaps partially explicable by the fact that they're all mainstream programs, as I mentioned earlier on, and they, they appeal, they have to appeal to their mixed target audience. So um, the dialogue has to remain intelligible, accessible, and comprehensible to this target audience. Perhaps it could also be an attempt to avoid othering um, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander characters. Um, but to, to identify whether that is indeed a conscious strategy on the part of screen creators, we would really need to do more research in terms of actually asking the screen creators and doing some um, research into that, for example, through interviews. Just comparing the three programs again, um, viewers who watch Mystery Road will encounter the most variety of AE types, as well as the highest proportion of um, AE tokens, and also highly limited dialogue in traditional Indigenous languages. Uh, those who watch Cleverman will encounter the least variety of AE types and the lowest proportion of AE tokens, but um, there's actually the most engagement with what I've called less familiar AE lexis. And um, the series, of course, as I mentioned, also features signif significant amount of dialogue in two traditional indigenous languages. And then finally, Red for Now, which is the earliest of the three series, it features no dialogue in traditional indigenous languages, but its proportional use of AE tokens is only slightly lower than Mystery Road, and it features a high, high variety of AE types than Cleverman. Now, I have to say, obviously, um, these comparative results are influenced by narrative factors, such as, for example, the setting, the characters and the storylines. And I pointed to that when I talked about Cleverman. But also what I found interesting is that I think that we can identify across all three shows some evidence for the importance of kinship terms, um, as well as the tag A, and also words relating to identity, community, and culture. And I think it is also likely that many of these words are easily recognizable, familiar, and salient cues for the Australian target audience. In addition, I would also say that the results from these indigenous author television dramas that I have analyzed here are quite different from the results that Meek presented in relation to indigenous characters in the US media, which I summarized earlier. So in this, in turn, I think it shows the impact of indigenous creative control on the deployment of linguistic uh, resources, even if it is mitigated by the commercial media context and also the, the mainstream target audience. Um, and clearly, you know, there's this scope of, uh, of improvement and developments, perhaps as the audience also improves and develops. So I, I also want to point out some limitations of uh, the case study. So the lexical profiling was a, it was a good starting point, I thought. But um, as I mentioned, it required extensive qualitative analysis as well um, of all relevant tokens, which was really very time consuming. Um, in addition, of course, there was a focus, focus on, uh, on Lexis and in the individual word forms, and we need to move beyond this, and we need to move beyond Lexis. We need to look at uh, syntactic structure, pragmatic resources, turn taking, etc. There's also ne this necessity of looking and analyzing uh, 
the context of situation, for example, the speaker, the interlocutor, the setting. And, um, you know, it is possible, for example, for non-Aboriginal characters to use AAE lexis. And sometimes it's quite interesting to look at what happens in those interactions from a narrative point of view, like what, what's happening. Um, we could also compare, obviously, mediated AAE with unscripted usage. And uh, most importantly, I think it would be really useful to analyze production and reception. So for example, are, is this type of Lexis actually used consciously and strategically by screen creatives? Um, what is their language awareness in relation to the words that are identified here? Um, now, this is something that I'm very interested in, as well as the audience reactions as well. How do audiences react to this kind of Lexis? But I just want to give an example from the production aspects here. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this for a different program, just because um, there's a different program where there's actually a detailed press kit. And that included some interesting um, information about the creation of AAE and language awareness. So um, I'm just showing this in terms of what you, what you can do by looking at production. So this is a press kit um, about Little J and Big Cuss. Um, this is a um, uh, animated uh, series for four to six year olds, which was broadcast on SBS in Australia. Um, it has uh, a number of uh, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people in the workforce, including directors, screenwriters, voice actors, and the stories themselves also draw on, on lived experiences. It also has non-Indigenous personnel, um, including animators, storyboarders, production personnel, and the producer, Ned Lander. In terms of the screen creatives and the creation of dialogue in Little J and Big Cuss, uh, we can see clear evidence of collaborative authorship. So there were script meetings and also writers' workshops um, to create what has been called in the, in the press kit, a standardized Aboriginal vernacular. So um, for example, using fella, um, as, as, as the term that you find in the dialogue in, instead of uh, other variants. So um, this is an interesting uh, quote from this uh, press kit as well by the uh, script producer. And she talks about how, um, how, how this worked. And she says, uh, we set up table readings of every script at first or second draft stage with one of the writers and an actor brought in specifically for this process. Um, as first and second drafts were taking place, we gave ourselves yet another challenge to give the series a further language texture. Little day because and their classmates code switch, speaking mainstream English in the classroom. When they're with Nana and on country, they speak more Aboriginal English. The differences are subtle, but, but it's an additional element of authenticity. So by looking at production um, texts or also maybe interviewing um, screen creatives, we, we get some additional um, layers of information. Uh, how was the dialogue produced? And we can also derive some information on the language awareness and attitudes of those involved in the production. So for example, here you can see an awareness of code switching on the part of the script producer. And you can also see something about the language um, uh, attitudes and values. So here, something about um, so-called authenticity. So um, I think a corpus-based study of linguistic diversity in the media uh, does need to be complemented by other methods and approaches that examine, for example, how the dialogue that we as corpus linguists retrieve and analyze through corpus linguistic techniques was produced. And that includes looking at the language awareness and attitudes of those involved in the production, but also uh, the audience as well. So looking at how um, this is, is actually received by different audience groups. And it's only then really, I think, uh, that we can see a fuller picture um, to emerge about how linguistic diversity is created and appears in the media and also how, how it is received and how it is consumed. And uh, thank you for listening. And I'll uh, just put, I've just put some selected references here um, on the slide. <laughs>